Hello again. In this episode, we journey to Glen Kinglass to climb Ben Nanainen, a remote outlier of the Glen Etuv range. Along the way, we'll explore how the spectacular granites of the Kruikin and Etuv Munros were created, and discover the history of iron making in Glen Kinglass and Bon Hall. If you find yourself enjoying the show, hit that like button and subscribe to see new episodes as soon as they arrive. Ben Nanainen is a 957 metre Munro connected to the Etiv range by a low Bialik with Ben Starov and Glass Van Voor, which is how it's most commonly approached. With no road links or any means of easy access, this is a quiet, peaceful mountain that's usually only climbed by determined Munroists. Its position makes it a steep and inconvenient addition to the Etiv round, while the alternative eastern approach entails a long walk in from Victoria Bridge. Luckily for us, that walking is through a wild mountain landscape of outstanding beauty and solitude. At the end of the day, you can't do Ben Nanainen quickly, plus taking your time really pays off in terms of scenery. From Victoria Bridge, we follow the track again along to Clashgur Hut, leaving it shortly thereafter to follow a muddy but pleasant path beside the Avon Shira, until the unmarked gate to Clashgur Farm is reached in front of the Al Kabar. The track leads away towards the river, but the OS map lies to you, the bridge over it is long gone. Instead, we follow a footpath west to a wooded section to reach the well-maintained Clashgur footbridge a little further upstream. From here, the track continues beside quiet Loch Dochard to a moorland traverse reaching around 300 metres, giving outstanding views of the Etiv range to the north. Here, the path descends into Kur Bay, fording the Alp Kur Bay and then the River Kinglass to gain entry to Glen Kinglass itself. If the King Glass is in spate, continue 500 metres or so south along the riverbank to find another sturdy footbridge. There follows a pleasant ascent to the falls of King Glass, where the river flows over beautiful granite pavements that in summer offer an idyllic rest point, not to mention a fine foot spa. From the falls, a very faint ATV track leads up towards Kurvinian, Corrie of the Mountains. This is ascended to a pair of small knolls where the route up the East Ridge begins. Henceforth, the going is pathless but manageable, and once upon the crest, the route to the far summit becomes clear. With excellent views all around, the ridge winds its way up over grass and granite slabs to the Bialach Frech, Call of the Heather. From here it's a moderately steep ascent with a couple of easy steps to the paved top of point 744, from where Ben Starov appears in all its rocky splendour. The route descends to the Bialach Laird without losing too much altitude, but Ben Nanainen's summit slopes are defended by a final bouldery ridge rising steeply to the final Bialach around 800 metres. Once this is over with, a steep but grassy gully leads you up to the summit, where the sudden and astonishing view out to sea across Loch Etiv and the endless high mountains stretching to the northern horizon provide just reward for your travels. While the East Ridge doesn't present any technical difficulties, it's important to keep hydrated because there aren't many streams on the ridge itself. You can avoid recrossing point 744 on descent by cutting down from the Bialach Leyen into Kura Vinyan, joining the original ATV track back to the start at the Falls of Kinglass. Those in a hurry to return to Victoria Bridge may wish to descend the North Ridge to the Bialach and make a pathless descent down Kurna Kaim to rejoin the original track back to Victoria Bridge at Kurbea. What's happening guys? Here we are back at beautiful Victoria Bridge and way over there in the distance you can see Ben Nanainen which is the Munro we're going to be tackling on this outing. Now Ben Nanainen lies pretty much at the head of Glen Kinglass which is another gorgeous glen as we'll see. Let's make tracks! Well, here lies the path that we're going to be taking all the way along to Glen Kinglass. There she lies, yonder.
Well, here we are just about to take the path along the river bank. Ben and Aenon getting closer, slowly. Up there, rising majestically above the trees, you can see Stop Curran Albanach, peak of the Scotsman's Corrie, still bearing some patches of snow into June. Well, these pleasant little stepping stones will take us over the Alt Gabar and along there. Now, as mentioned in the intro, the track continues along here where there used to be a bridge. There is no more, sadly. Hence, we're going to take the slightly higher ground up there through this little wooded corridor. Well, just here, the path bears away to the south in front of Bensuya there. And we're going to rejoin the river and make our way over it. Now, when the bridge further back there that served the actual track it was taken away basically because it was becoming too dangerous to use, the erstwhile Gary and Ramblers and the Scottish Rights of Way and Access Society refurbished this old bridge, of which the original remnants are basically these two iron archways and obviously they've used tension cables to strengthen the bridge. Now the bridge is fairly bouncy so uh, make sure you go over it slowly. What a panorama! Now just on that rise in the foreground you can see the path bearing up to reach Loch Dochard. Wow, here we are, a gorgeous Loch Dochard. Well, just as Loch Dochard comes into view, we found our first piece of granite pavement that we're going to find a hell of a lot more of on the way up Benanainen. Granite is one of the strongest natural materials known to man. It comes in a variety of eye-catching forms and colours, from the pinks of Ben Cruachan to the blues of the Cairngorms and the black cliffs of the coast. It creates amazing phenomena like pavements, high mesas, sea stacks, dramatic spires and iconic sculptures of outstanding beauty and durability. What process could forge such wonders? How can rock that's harder than steel be sculpted so delicately? It's time to get geological. Granites are igneous rocks, which means they formed from magma. Magma is created when rock in the Earth's crust is subjected to such extreme heat from tectonic activity that it melts, gradually forming vast chambers of molten material deep in the Earth. Jammed between the pressure and heat from the Earth's core and the immense weight of the crust bearing down from above, the magma is gradually forced upward, melting through softer rock and spreading into various features on its way to the surface, where it becomes volcanic lava, often in dramatic style. When cool, this becomes extrusive rock, i.e. it's passed through the Earth's crust and extruded above it. The magma that doesn't make it into disaster movies remains within the crust, very gradually radiating its heat into the cooler, often insulating rock around it. The immense pressure within the crust forces the magma to solidify in all the spaces it occupied in its liquid state, put simply within the mould created by the rock it's no longer hot enough to eat through. Once solid, it becomes intrusive rock. It's intruded into the crust, but hasn't made it all the way through. 
What kind of rock it forms depends on factors too complicated to cover here, but generally, the deeper in the crust a rock forms, the harder and heavier its components. Granite forms deep in the magma chambers hollowed out of the crust, forming enormous sheets and domes known as batholiths. The vast majority of granite on Earth lies below its surface. Over hundreds of millions of years, the batholith is slowly pushed to the surface by the heat, pressure and friction of the tectonic process, while erosion and glaciation may gradually remove the younger rock above it. When the batholith emerges onto the surface, the results are dramatic and usually mountainous. A good example is El Capitan and the Sierra Nevada in the US, where a vast area of the granite batholith has been exposed in Yellowstone National Park, revealing its liquid origin through enormous flowing curves. On a smaller scale, a section of batholith formed the mountains of Glen Etiv during a violent tectonic event called the Caledonian Orogeny, which we learned about at Cruach Ardron. The resultant granite intrusion here is called the Etiv Pluton, which stretches roughly from Ben Cruachan to Stop Gavar and includes all the Etiv Munros. Originally far taller, these mountains were eroded and glaciated over the Devonian era to form the Munros we see today. Granite's great strength comes from the fact that it's a dense, tightly packed material with no internal structure. The enormous heat and pressure in the Earth's crust caused liquid magma to crystallise into minerals evenly throughout the rock as it cooled, rather than separating them into distinct layers, as with slate or limestone. Granite is mostly comprised of feldspar, silicate, rock-forming minerals that make up much of the Earth's crust, and, as we can see here, large amounts of quartz or quartz diorites. These densely fused components give granite its exceptionally high integrity, which makes it ideal for building things with, a quality recognised early on by, among others, the ancient Egyptians. Over there you can see Miel Nanun, which, for a Miel, looks pretty gnarly, doesn't it? Check these overhangs here facing us. Over there you can see Glashvan Vor, Ben Starov, and Ben Nanainen basking in the sunshine. Here you can see point seven four four, this dark hump in the foreground. And that's a top we're gonna have to head over on our way up to the summit. Up here, you can see this rather minimalist shelter, this old cow shed. It seems to have uh, played host to many a Duke of Edinburgh expedition, uh, judging by the graffiti in here. Well, beyond the cow shed, we make our way towards the Moorland Traverse and the high point of our walk in. Oh my! As you can see, the views open out. To a new level of epicness. The pointy horn of Ben Cruachan down there, Tainalt Peak. Here in the sun, in the foreground in front of those, Ben Achokul from episode 2. And over there, below the shiny slopes of Ben Nanainen, you can see the river Kinglas emerging from the top of the quarry there at its source. And you can also see the Bialach with Glas Van Voor. Forward to the river.
Well, here's a good example of said granite slabs. And you can see the little sparkly bits there. And the quartz, other mineral crystals are uh, reflecting. It's gorgeous, isn't it? I've got a real thing for these pavements. Kind of scratches and lines on it. Looks like they've been kind of engraved by nature. The smooth surfaces and the strange score marks we see in the granites of the area are the result of glaciation, when vast ice sheets covered the highlands during the ice ages, grinding away sedimentary rock and polishing the exposed granite through a process called glacial abrasion. As it moves, the glacier plucks vast chunks of granite from mountainsides and carries them with it, producing the missing block appearance of many crags and cliffs we see in the hills. On a much smaller scale, the bottom of the glacier contains granite pebbles of less than a centimetre, and it's these that smooth off the granite into its rounded form like sandpaper on wood. When a granite pebble is significantly harder than the granite it's being dragged across, the immense pressure of the ice above forces the pebble downwards, slowly etching a line called a striation. This is what we mean when we say rock is striated, it has had its surface engraved by the glaciers of the Ice Ages. Onward, get a head over here on the other side of the river, down into Glen Kinglass proper. Here, the Alt Bea and the River Kinglass form a small island, which the route crosses, if the rivers aren't in spate, that is. And here's the other branch of the River Kinglass, which, as you can see, is no bother at all. Now, if it is a bother, there's a bridge just around that knoll there uh, that'll get you over without having to get your feet wet. So let's bash on over there. Here we are, entering Glen Kinglass proper, and it just gets more idyllic the further along you go. Just down here, there's a little waterfall, which is where we leave this track to head up Ben Nanainen, up here. Tomorrow, of course. So that means we're going to set up tent somewhere down beside that waterfall. Here the King Glass flows over a lovely granite watercourse, which is just asking for you to dip your feet into those little rock pools. Ah, that's better. Wait, what's that high-pitched buzzing sound? Well, I've managed to find it's about the only bit of kind of uh, flat ground here, and the midges are beginning to bite. So it's time to get up the tent and hide. 
Hello, mister. Wow. Now, this is rare. Pine mart in there. Coming out to dip his paws in the river. Now, they're pretty fierce and they've got a nasty bite, apparently, but my word, they're cute. Gotta be one of my favourite Scottish animals. Hey, buddy. This one's pretty brave. They normally kind of disappear as soon as they see a human. Morning is broken. Beautiful spot this, isn't it? Now that the midges have abated. Now, we're gonna head up this very faint ATV track up to those rocks there near the wooded little ravine. And then basically head up the skyline here to the southeast ridge of Banana Inn. Let's do it. Just up here, we're gonna leave the track and head up between these two kind of rocky knolls here and on to the pathless ridge itself. Gorgeous little wooded ravine down here, a little gully. And uh, got all those granite pavements down there. Well, we're nearly on the ridge crest here. Going King Glass down there. And finally the summit has appeared. <laughs> All the way up there. You can see with the sun shining just on the very top. Well, eventually, here we are, emerging onto the winding east ridge of Ben Nanainen. We're about to get a view back the way we've come, towards Victoria Bridge along here. Look at that! Stokhavar over there. And looking all the way back up to Rannoch Moor. Down there, you can see Placid Loch Dochard. And now revealed in all its glory, our mission, should we choose to accept it. Now according to some guidebooks, the overstimulated uh, can make their way up this pretty sheer face here, but I would certainly not advise that, to be honest. Only for the masochistic. The way we've come may add a little extra distance, but it's a hell of a lot more manageable and enjoyable for that matter. Well, here we are making our way towards point 744. And just before it, Bialach Freach, which as enthusiasts will know, means Bialach of the Heather or Pass of the Heather. Over there, Glash van Voor, Stopkuran Albanach, and Mielnanun.
And here we are at the Bialach Freyach. It's only really sparsely populated with heather, but uh, we'll let it off. From the bottom of that to the top, it's roughly about 100 metres. And the summit? Still catching the sun. Let's hope it's still around when we get up there. For now, let's get to the top of this lump. Look at that up there. Looks like some kind of ancient Sumerian citadel. The granite on the ridge crest is very coarse grained, which gives fantastic traction in a manner similar to the ramp back on Ben Kruken in episode 1. Not all granite shows the same characteristics, however. The silicate within it can also be fine grained, producing sand, as we'll see later on the summit itself. From here, the way is clear onto the real summit of Ben Nanainen. Well, the sun's gone in, giving us a little bit of shade. Here you can see the brief descent. I thought it was going to be longer, to be honest. Um, and then back up towards the summit itself. Doesn't look too bad, does it? Let's head on over there. The batholith does not always emerge unscathed. As it rises towards the surface in places with a lot of rainfall, like the UK, a complex process of gravity, erosion and weathering breaks up the granite into the features we call tors. This begins while the rock is still underground, where rising granite domes start to crack vertically under the force of gravity, while variations in weight distribution and soil density result in horizontal fractures. These are geologically termed joints. When in contact with the regolith, the earth and soil above the bedrock, water begins to seep into these joints, gradually eroding them until blocks are formed. The expansion of water into ice during the freeze-thaw cycle widens the joints further, as regolith begins to enter the space between the blocks. Here, chemical weathering from the soil produces concentric, or spheroidal, erosion, wherein the blocks are rounded into well, spheroids, the smooth, attractive stones we see littered across the plateau here. Depending on the level of erosion, these unstable stacks may make it to the surface before they eventually crumble into debris, and when they do, they form tors, striking landforms of sculptural beauty and elegance. As you can see, it's very Ben kruchen like isn't it? It's a rocky landscape. Now in terms of a path, this is the most obvious example I've seen so far. The route until now has been super scrappy, but um, from here it's kind of difficult to get lost really, isn't it, in visibility like this. Onward to the business end of the mission. And here we are, at the final Bialik. Yes! 
All that remains is this moderate pull up these summit slopes to the top. Here we are about maybe 70 meters away from the summit, I hope. <laughs> Could well be false summits there, but nearly there. Cop this gorgeous panorama. Whoa. And even more await at the summit. Yeah, they were kind of false summits, but not by much. There it is. Thankfully, the last lap. Let's head up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now that is a summit panel. Loch Etiv down here, winding round towards the sea and the Isle of Mull. Bonnie Ben Kruken, fantastically prominent over there. Mission accomplished. Oh. 
In the early 18th century, an Irish coal partnership bought the timber rights to forested areas in Lower Glen Kinglass from, among others, the second Earl of Breadalbin, Campbell of Loch Nell. At this point in history, living costs for landed gentry were increasing amid an economic contraction, which meant that the large sums paid by the Irish timber companies to develop the land were an attractive cash injection to landowners. As you probably guessed, the reason for the Irishmen renting the land was not so that they could enjoy the beautiful forestry. By 1725, they had built a furnace and what came to be known as the Ard Maddy Ironworks, in reference to the small settlement nearby on Loch Etiv. This furnace and its successor at Bon Haw would unfortunately result in the devastation of the ancient pine and oak forests of Argyll, which were felled in order to fuel the fires of industry. In an arrangement that, at first, seems absurdly convoluted, the raw iron ore was shipped in by sea from Furness in Cumbria, and the processed iron sent back the same way. Why? Well, because iron smelting consumed an enormous amount of fuel. Before the cheaper and far more efficient coke became widely available, charcoal was the only fuel that would burn hot enough for smelting. It's estimated that producing a day's worth of iron required two acres of forestry to be felled. There simply wasn't enough fuel in the local area of the iron deposits, in this case Cumbria, to run an ironworks, while transporting charcoal was extremely wasteful. Much of the fuel would be reduced to dust en route. Thus, it was marginally cheaper to transport the ore for smelting somewhere with lots of trees and few people to notice their absence somewhere like Northern Argyll. Glen Kinglass and the shores of Loch Etiv were heavily forested, emphasis on the were, and since the 17th century, English ironmasters had adopted the practice of taking the ore to the fuel-rich areas by boat. The Kinglass ironworks were a major financial concern at the time, and lessons learned there would be invaluable to its successor, the Bon Ore Furnace near Tainald. The Irish Cooperative ran the ironworks in Glen Kinglass from around 1723 to 1738, when it became profitable. The Bon Ore Furnace was built in 1753 and lasted much longer, until 1876. The Etive furnaces generally produced pig iron, which would be further processed back down south, or cannonballs. In 1781 alone, Bonneau produced 42,000 such projectiles, each ranging from 1 to 32 kilograms in weight. You're going to need a bigger boat. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, hitting like and subscribing really helps the channel to grow and to create more free content like this for you to enjoy. Next time, we venture to the mouth of Glencoe to climb Kreja and Mjolavuri. Until then, enjoy your adventures.